Welcome to episode 301 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Zorka Martinovich, who served in the FBI for over 21 years. In this episode, she reviews the extensive administrative support provided by the FBI's Critical Incident Crisis Negotiation Unit, CNU, when a Cuban-American businessman was kidnapped for ransom in Panama by the FARC, a Colombian terrorist organization. Beyond the case review, Zorka explains all of the -the behind-the-scenes negotiations made by the FBI and State Department officials to assist families seeking to secure the release of U.S. citizens held hostage by terrorists. Now, before I continue, I should note that this case review is very timely, but it was recorded before the horrific Hamas attacks and hostage-taking in southern Israel. However, it does provide an excellent understanding of what might be happening in Gaza as the U.S. government works to assist in the release of the hostages who I hope and pray will be coming home soon. Zorka has been asked by the media to comment regarding this crisis. Zorka served in the FBI for over 21 years. Her first assignment was in the Milwaukee Division, where she worked white-collar crime matters, served as the Employee Assistance Coordinator, and was part of the National Critical Incident Stress Management Team. While in Milwaukee, she completed the vigorous undercover agent course and trained as a crisis hostage kidnap negotiator. She was selected to the FBI's Elite Critical Incident Negotiation Team, where she was deployed on behalf of the program to support major operations outside the continental U.S., overseas kidnaps and national security special events, and was later promoted as a supervisory special agent in the CNU, where she spent the last 13 years of her FBI career. Zorka's operational experience included working with families, employers, government representatives, foreign colleagues, and the military to safely resolve more than 100 domestic and international hostage kidnap and crisis negotiation matters, resulting in her recognition as a subject matter expert. She has served on the National Security Council's hostage working group to shape U.S. policy on hostage response. As part of the FBI Academy's adjunct faculty, Zorka has taught extensively in the law enforcement community throughout the world and designed a course on hostage survival taught for over a decade to FBI personnel deploying overseas. Since retiring from the FBI, she continues presenting at conferences and consulting on matters relating to leadership and crisis response. Now, before we get to the interview with Zorka... I want to congratulate retired agent Pete Lapp from episode 243 on the publication of his book, Queen of Cuba, an agent's insider account of the spy who invaded detection for 17 years. In your podcast app's description of this episode, you'll find links to where you can join my reader team, which is all about FBI crime fiction. Buy me a cup of coffee and learn more about me and my nonfiction book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, and my two FBI crime novels, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, available wherever books are sold as ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks on Audible and Spotify. My FBI word search puzzle book makes a fun stocking stuffer. One last thing. I have to admit that I am still bouncing off the wall with excitement about the 300th episode, which was covered by the Washington Post. Thank you for your support. Now, here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired agent Zorka Martinovich. Hey, Zorka, how are you? Hi, Jerry. Good to be with you today. I really am fascinated by, see, I've already used the word. I was, <laughs> I was just telling you how I have had listeners write me and tease me about using the word fascinating so much. One just suggested that I have like a little button that I make saying, that's so fascinating. But I truly am fascinated by the stories that my guests tell. 
And I'm already getting prepared to use that word many times as you go through this case review, because we don't get to hear about kidnappings, especially international kidnappings and the work that the FBI does to negotiate the return of American citizens who have been kidnapped overseas. So where do you want to start? This specific case, I'd like to start with the phrase, we don't negotiate with terrorists. I think it's been repeated. It's been amplified. It's been said by very recognized political figures. It's not accurate. It lacks detail. And yet it's become part of the gospel in the lexicon of American culture. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about where that came from. And it's such a part of our culture that if you've ever seen the movie Tropic Thunder with Tom Cruise, he plays a Hollywood studio mogul. Is that the same movie with Robert Downey Jr.? Yes, it is. Okay, okay, I remember it. And one of the people in his orbit has been kidnapped. And in a scene, he actually says, we don't negotiate with terrorists. That has spread like wildfire, but leaves the wrong impression out there on cases when U.S. citizens are kidnapped overseas by foreign terrorist organizations. In 2008, April of that year, a U.S. citizen named Cecilio Padron was kidnapped in Panama. Now, Jerry, most kidnappings of U.S. citizens overseas, I would say, are crimes of opportunity. But this one was different. First, we don't have a lot of kidnappings in Panama, even though it is adjacent to shares a border with Colombia, where we do have a lot of kidnappings. But this is in an upscale neighborhood in the middle of the day, in an area where he works and lives. There is a group of police officers who stop him and who proceed to kidnap him. Again, this is somewhat unheard of, and it's a bad look for Panama, but they grab him and take him. And we think, what's going on here? And what we learn is that Mr. Padron is transferred to a beach area where who we believe to be the FARC, a terrorist organization that's been operating in Colombia for decades, takes control of him. That there's some coordination with these corrupt police officers and the FARC terrorist group. They take control of him. They pay off the police officers and they go on their way to transport Mr. Padron into the jungle. So it's a pretty brazen crime. Again, in the middle of the day, lots of witnesses seeing what's happening, and yet we're somewhat flat-footed on the fact that it happened at all. FARC is spelled F-A-R-C. Do you have any idea what that stands for? It's a Spanish translation, Fuerzas Americanas, like a revolutionary group. They are a group that's been operating in and around Colombia for decades And I think memory has faded for people in how brutal and successful they were over those decades, not only in kidnapping, but in drug trafficking and other crimes associated. So at that point in time, the FARC is so large, they've got over what we believe to be 700 hostages being held throughout the country in their different fronts of the FARC. They're very effective. They make a lot of money off kidnappings, but also involved in lots of other criminal activities. People need to be reminded of that because it gives it context. I think today, when we think about organizations like ISIS, FARC was one of the originals. Vast, like a huge business organization with a recruiting arm, with a training arm. They had their own calendar. So different things that, again, organizationally, you see how vast they are and how they're able to accomplish as much as they can, despite Colombia making good efforts in order to essentially eradicate them. They are very brutal. This group has instructed their members, kidnap, kill U.S. citizens, attack U.S. interests, solely for the support of the U.S. of the Colombian government. So as part of Plan Colombia, which is an investment the U.S. made long-term in money and training, the military to eradicate drug trafficking and other criminal activity going on there. All of this is this long-term investment. It gives you the broad perspective on what's going on in that area, in the country, when Mr. Padron is snatched off the street. A little bit about him. He's about 67 years of age at that time. Good health at the time of the kidnap. He's fit. He's vital. He's essentially young at heart. I think he's in his fourth marriage. He's got kids by various marriages of different ages, so some very small, some maybe teenage, and some well into their 30s. 
Mr. Padron is a very successful businessman in Panama. He works in construction. He builds offices, different buildings, very successful, somewhat known in the area because he's lived there for a long time, despite the fact that he is a U.S. citizen. He is actually a Cuban exile living in Miami area as well, very active in the anti-Castro community. That aspect will play a role in his own understanding of the group and of the political dynamics of what's going on in Panama and Colombia at the time of his kidnapping, which will help him later in his own hostage survival. So he's a smart guy, unfortunate circumstances. This is one where he did nothing to put himself in a bad situation, where he took on more risk than he should have, where he was in a neighborhood that he shouldn't have been. None of that. He was just snatched off the street by corrupt police officers who were coordinating with the FARC to kidnap Americans who they believed had the appearance of wealth. And certainly, in fairness, Mr. Padron was a successful businessman. So in that regard, very much a targeted kidnapping. Maybe you're going to get to this, but I'm just so curious about these corrupt police officers. Were they members of the FARC or they just were very well compensated for participating in this kidnapping? That's a great question. My understanding is that they were compensated. How well? I guess it depends on your perspective. They did receive money for it. They were subsequently arrested because there were lots of witnesses on the street, thankfully. And again, bad look for Panama. So they were very aggressive in working with the U.S. to address the situation and find the perpetrators of the crime. I don't know what they were thinking and how they thought they could get away with this, But it was a great start to have a better understanding of what was going to be on the horizon for us. Also, during this time, I think it's important to understand in those 700 hostages that are being held in the jungles of Colombia, there are three other U.S. hostages who are being held as part of the high value hostage group by the first front of the FARC. Those hostages at this time have been held for about five years. They were doing drug interdiction in the country. Their plane went down in the jungle. The FARC got to them before the Colombian military was able to get to them. When they go to the camp where they're being held, they meet other high-value hostages who have been held for upwards of 10 years. You can imagine how that would impact your mental health, essentially, on imagining what's the likelihood of getting out alive. We have both of these cases working in parallel to some degree. And one of our first concerns is that Mr. Padron, being a dual citizen, U.S. citizen, might be moved into the high value hostage group, which would be concerning because, again, the infrastructure that the FARC has to hold people for long periods of time without a great deal of opportunity for a potential rescue. And for them, the high value hostages are really considered political prisoners. They're looking to the U.S. for concessions whether it be prisoner releases of their comrades or other things that they want from the U.S. government, which is not going to happen. And that's in comparison to the other kidnapped victims, which may just be for money. Yes. The vast majority of kidnappings that happen of U.S. citizens, and nowadays we're talking probably 100 to 150 a year, the vast majority, whether they be criminal or terrorist, are oftentimes about money, about a ransom. The kidnapped victim is a commodity, and they're looking to get something of value for that person. Even if they start out not being about money, what you can do is work to get it to be about money, because it's the one thing that will be in control of the family who's going to work on behalf of their loved one. It's an important distinction because, again, when it's about political issues, we're expecting terrorist groups to understand U.S. policy. And we have a lot of people in the U.S. government who probably don't understand all the nuances of our own policy. So it gets tricky. But money is straightforward, and it's something that can be accomplished generally to essentially work to secure their safe release. For us, we frame what does success look like. For me personally, if we can get the hostage out safely, that's success. More long-term, certainly the case agents who are working these cases, we're looking to identify, apprehend, and prosecute the perpetrators of this crime. And that could take years because we are working overseas, but we've had a good amount of success with any number of groups. But again, if that hostage doesn't come out alive, it's somewhat of a, a hollow success because we're in the business of saving lives and not avenging deaths. So we want those hostages to come home alive, regardless of what happens afterwards. When you talked about somebody being held as a hostage for 10 years, 
I'm thinking to myself, well, then what's the purpose? It's actually costing the terrorist money to hold that person for 10 years, and no one is coming forward to either pay the ransom or make some type of political prisoner exchange. So what's the purpose of holding somebody for 10 years? Why? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Because they can hold them for long periods of time. I think a lot of groups look at it from the perspective of when we're ready to use this person, we'll use them. It's just kind of putting them aside while they're doing their other criminal activity, while they're fighting wars, while they're doing other things. We have this in our pocket. And when we want to use it, we will look to use it. And it is somewhat of a cudgel against other Western governments because these cases oftentimes will be in the news to some degree that can put pressure on the government, even if nothing tangible is accomplished. There is a method to their madness. I think they are very deliberate in their efforts. And once they have someone, it's worthwhile to just hold on to them until a point in which they are ready to negotiate for something. Usually the most straightforward thing to negotiate for is money. These groups, like any large business, need to meet their payroll. They're looking for money to run the operating expenses of their organization, pay their bills, pay the people who are working for them, buy food, buy equipment. It is a very practical aspect, and that's why I say there's a method to their madness, because we tend to look at them as barbarians, as horrible people. They can be all those things, but they're also very deliberate in working towards accomplishing something very specific. And usually they have an objective in mind. And if that objective is money, that is something that can be worked through. It's almost as if these longtime held kidnap victims are investments, human investments mm -hmm. that they're just holding on to until they're ready to cash them in. I've never thought of it that way. I think that is a great analogy. Absolutely. This is like a, a T-bond or, or something else that they can just sit on for when the time is right. And again, because they have the infrastructure, a lot of criminal organizations do not have the infrastructure to hold people for long periods of time. They feel the heat of the police looking for these hostages. They know they want to turn them over relatively quickly. So most cases are going to resolve, say, within a week, maybe a few weeks. The protracted cases tend to be those groups that, again, have the infrastructure to hold people for long periods of time and maintain these people, like you mentioned, as an investment. For us, we look at it, everything is a crisis, so nothing is a crisis. We're like the emergency room, the case comes in, we get our plan together, and we work to secure the safe release of the hostage. What's interesting in this is that we learn not too long before Mr. Padron is kidnapped, there was a dispute on a construction project he was working on. It had escalated to the courts and was reported in the media that his net worth was between 13 and $18 million. It's likely that that, to some degree, put a target on his back as someone who has means and who might be a good person to kidnap. Kind of external things that people tend to notice and work into their rationale for who they might target as a kidnapping. What we're lucky is that for decades, the Bureau, the Crisis Negotiation Unit specifically, has been working kidnaps, not only in Colombia, but throughout the world. We have deep experience in how these cases are most likely to successfully resolve, and we have a good track record overall. It doesn't mean everyone comes home safely, but most will and most do. What's different in this case is that we have a new hostage policy that puts some limitations on what we can do when it involves a foreign terrorist organization. If it's a criminal group, we have a lot of latitude. But if it's a designated foreign terrorist organization, we have some limitations, and that's what becomes the complicating factor in Mr. Padron's case. Because we don't have a lot of experience with the policy specifically, he gets caught in the middle of us working through trying to figure out how this policy should apply. So we owe him a debt of gratitude for that. As we move on, the basic things that are happening, we have case agents in Miami and negotiators in Miami who work there locally. We have some of his local family in Miami, his first wife, his son, who's in his mid to late 30s, a sister, a brother. And they're likely the family that we believe will be best suited to work as family communicators and to make the decisions on his behalf. 
There's an early phone call from the hostage takers to his wife in Panama, but she's ill-suited for the job. She's kind of young. She's got some small kids. Is not really going to work really well, especially when we have other options. The other options being the son in Miami. So that tends to work really well. Our Miami agents and negotiators go meet with the family, talk to them, essentially do a presentation on what to expect, what kind of assistance the government provides, what we don't provide, talk a little bit about what we know about the case so far. We want to compare notes with them, who's most likely responsible, how they're most likely to contact them. Is it by email, by phone call, however this may be, who they're most likely to contact, how soon are they most likely to contact, all of these background details to help them prepare. We're going to work with them. Even though I have read your bio at the beginning of this episode, for those who may have skipped that part, could you talk about where you are and the role that you're playing in all of this and your unit? Sure. At this time, I'm physically located in the crisis negotiation unit at Quantico. I'm a supervisor there. I'm a program manager. I oversee kidnapping cases in addition to a myriad of other things that our unit does. So I came from the Milwaukee field office. I was a field negotiator with experience working with families of kidnapped victims. You did an episode on Granny Snatcher. I was the person who worked directly with the family. In that case, I was also a member of the FBI's critical incident negotiation team which is a team of field negotiators who essentially augments the crisis negotiation unit in deploying domestically and internationally on any variety of cases. So I've been fortunate to have deep experience in these types of cases, having worked with families firsthand in person in kidnap matters. I support the negotiators in Miami who are forward working with the family based on my own experience, based on the support I have received in the past, or maybe support that I thought was lacking in the past. I tend to be more involved than most, I think, supervisors. I like to join calls with the family. If I'm not physically co-located, if it's a projected case, I will generally travel and meet with the family along with the local negotiators to give them a better idea of what's going on in Washington and more broadly, what's going on forward in the embassies that are supporting this case. Because it's a major effort by the U.S. government, yet there's only a handful of people who have the privilege of working directly with the family who they will ever meet. Yet there are literally hundreds of people behind us working along with us to help resolve this case. I straddle working forward with the family and with the team and working with the whole of government in bringing our resources together to try and get everyone on the same page to share in the success of bringing someone home alive. I do want to interrupt to say that that episode that you were talking about was episode 38 where I interviewed another member of the CNU, Tony Crabbit, and the episode was called Kidnapped Grandma Hostage Negotiations. So that's episode 38. If anybody wants to check that out to find out more about what the unit does, they can do that. You mentioned the American Embassy. Is that how the family was initially notified of the kidnapping, or did they contact the family directly? Initially, it can be a real scramble on who makes that first contact. It could be the embassy who gets word. It could be some witness on the street if somebody was with him. It might have been his wife who got word first. His wife was physically in Panama. And I don't remember specifically how they learned of it. But I think once it became known, any number of people are calling into the family to alert them to what is known. And the embassy, certainly consular affairs and other components in an embassy, provide a, a great deal of support in these cases. They're critical, especially in this one. What we know is that people are going to come out one of three ways. They're going to escape, they're going to have a negotiated release, or there's going to be a rescue. We explain this to the family and we let them know that based on our experience, the vast majority of people who come out safely, it is through a negotiated release. And most oftentimes it's going to be through the payment of a private ransom. Families are surprised that they are going to play such a significant role in the resolution of this. They're surprised they're the ones who come up with the private ransom, that there isn't some fund that they can tap into to provide ransom money on behalf of their loved one. It kind of puts them back on their heels almost because it's a shock that their loved one is kidnapped. And now they have to play a significant role in securing their safe release. 
but it's important that they participate with us and collaborate with us throughout. And why is that important? Because of the expertise and knowledge that has already been gathered by the U.S. government as a whole, or because the government wants to control this in some way? Well, it's a little bit of both, I think, in fairness. One is that each family has their own one unique experience. Where we come and we can bring a broader perspective in our collective experience on all the cases we've worked, not only across the globe, but specifically in Colombia, specifically with the FARC, and what do we know about this particular front of the FARC? That's information they wouldn't have. And that kind of information lets them have a sense of when will they be contacted? How will they be contacted? How long is this likely to take before it's resolved? what's essentially the market value or price point of a ransom that they are likely to accept, and other details that are useful in their efforts to secure the release of their loved one. The government absolutely wants to keep a close eye on what's going on with this too. So in fairness, certainly they don't want the family to be ripped off. They don't want to create more problems collectively, but they also want to monitor closely because these are criminals, these are terrorists, and we're going to be pursuing them from that perspective as well. So we'll be looking to build cases against them. They're probably already on our radar. Everyone has an interest in these cases. It's a matter of where we have shared interest And what do we have the political will to do to resolve these cases? And that's part that becomes a little bit tricky because people have different ideas of what they're willing to do. We have the initial contact by the hostage takers. They contact Eric, the son in Miami. And this is going to be a slow slog. Cases never go fast enough for any family. We would certainly like them to go faster too, but they take time. What we work to do is build a rhythm of sorts in our contacts. We work to schedule calls. The hostage takers are calling on a satellite phone from the jungle. They don't always have a great connection. So we say, oh, well, let's call every Monday at this time when Eric is available because he has a full-time job and he has a life and he has other things he's got to take care of. And if we don't hear from you for some reason, we're not going to freak out. We're going to think maybe there's weather or something else. Our plan B, our default call will be on Wednesday at this particular time. And it worked well. We had the calls. Sometimes we were able to speak with Mr. Padron. Sometimes we provided proof of life questions. But the scheduling of the calls was in both of our interests so that they would be available and that we would be available. And Eric would come to the call with a status update of his efforts on what he was doing. What's tricky with Mr. Padron is that he's a very successful businessman, and it doesn't surprise us that he's working on the inside to secure his own release. They have kidnapped the wrong person because they have kidnapped someone who has sole control of his money, and the family can't access it. So it's going to be tricky on coming up with a ransom. Eric works to explain this to his father when they have time to over the phone to essentially manage expectations and put a reality check in this whole thing. So eventually, Mr. Padron gets it. He realizes, I think after his own shock of being taken and looking at the circumstances that he finds himself in, he realizes the big picture of how this is going to need to work. He trusts Eric to do what's in his best interest, and he knows Eric is doing everything he can on his behalf with these complicating features that nobody had anticipated. It's a tough call, and it's going to take time to sort out. But Eric does a great job. He builds a trusted relationship with the case agents in Miami and the negotiators in Miami. They like each other. They meet regularly. They come with a plan. They offer recommendations. They make assessments. I work with the negotiators, we're talking constantly, going over what our plan's going to be, what's going on in Washington, how this is going to work. But again, managing everyone's expectations because this is not going to be as fast as anybody would like. So it's tricky. It's kind of strange because I would have never thought that it's a cordial business kind of like negotiation with terrorists. Yeah, I would say in most instances, at the end of the day, to the hostage takers, it's business. To the family, it's incredibly personal. They feel tremendous stress. They're under duress. They feel the responsibility and the weight and the gravity of the situation. But the hostage takers, it's business. Now, do they threaten? Yes. They tell Mr. Padron, if you try to escape, we're going to kill you. Whether they actually would or not, they might. Certainly hostage takers are willing to kill. They generally are not wanting to kill because that commodity is of value. 
but they do work to put pressure, a sales pitch on Eric. You need to work faster. We don't believe you that you don't have all this money available because they don't realize that in our culture here, even if somebody is valued at several million dollars, most of us have mortgages or car payments. We don't have liquid cash readily available. And that's the part that they can't understand, but we need to bring them around to understanding that this money that they imagine is out there is not out there. And we're willing to pay something, but it's going to have to be an amount that we can actually physically get and get to them. And it's going to take time. All of these hurdles slowly working through, but we're trying to get in a routine of sorts to just move it along. Time doesn't happen fast enough, more so for Mr. Padron, who is in very difficult circumstances living in the jungle. But we're aware of that. At least those of us who have direct contact with the family appreciate it because we see them and we talk to them. We're witness to it. The people who are removed from it, who are in Washington or in other places, don't feel that acute stress. So are probably not as sympathetic that there's an urgency about this, that we need to make it a priority and get moving along. So we do what we can and we bring everybody along with us. Eric's doing a great job. His family is completely supportive. They're making sure the calls go to him. And we get to a point, which is interesting, where the hostage takers are frustrated with Eric. It's not that they don't like the messenger. They don't like the message that they're not going to get $16 million, which is their demand. That, I think, is directly attached to the article in the press before his kidnapping. It's not going to happen. So we're managing expectations right away. But there is a willingness to pay some sort of ransom somewhere down the road. Tell us more about this article. So there was an article, I guess just a profile, saying what a great businessman he was and how much money he had. Kind of an advertisement for the terrorist. Yeah, I mean, just by coincidence, it's an article. Again, there's some conflict with a construction site, and it raises to the level where it has to go to court. Not unusual for the media, I guess, to report on it. What they include in there is, again, what he's valued at. And I suppose that's an aspect of this dispute that's going on, which somebody probably saw in the paper and got the idea that, hey, we should kidnap this guy because we're kidnappers and that's what we do. That is the basis for not only we're going to target this guy, but I believe it's also the basis for where does this number come from that they want $16 million? They don't pull that out of the air. And again, there's a method to their madness. And I think it's directly attached to the reporting that he's worth somewhere between 13 and $18 million. So they essentially want all of his money, which doesn't make sense at all, but that's going to take time. So we turn and we go, what's happening in D.C. in support of this? And that's really the negotiation within the negotiation, Jerry, because the family is straightforward. They're going to do whatever they need to on behalf of their loved one. The kidnappers are pretty clear in their objective. They want to get something for this commodity that they have, and it's generally going to be money. It's Washington where everybody's not on the same page. What we're lucky is that we're part of the National Security Council. There's a hostage working group. I serve on it as a member representing the Crisis Negotiation Unit, and it's essentially working level people from across the government who work this particular problem set. And our director at that time is Admiral Brian Losey. Brian makes sure everyone is accountable. Nothing would have happened without his leadership. I give him a lot of credit because we were meeting at least once a week. He was making sure everyone had due outs on what to do, and you came back to a meeting and you better be prepared for whatever was asked of you and your agency. If we're the representatives, we need to move it along. And he has a great appreciation for the urgency in this matter and how to make it work. So he's great. We have kind of the perspective of a case, Gracia Martin Burnham, Guillermo Sabero, who a couple years earlier, under this new policy, were kidnapped by Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines with mixed success. So we learn lessons there. We learn lessons from other cases. But this policy is relatively new, and we are working through a lot of issues in Washington that need to be addressed for the long term. And unfortunately for Mr. Padron, he just happens to be caught at a bad time where we do not have a good footing and people are not in agreement on how we should best support a family and how far we should go in allowing for the payment of ransom. U.S. policy, no concession by the U.S. government, but our push is that really to allow the family to pay a private ransom. Our questions to the family, are you willing to pay? If it's yes, how much are you able to pay? And that's really where the conversation starts and ends. If they are willing to pay, great, we're going to work with them. If they're not willing to pay, we may wait for an escape, which is not likely in this case. A rescue is not coming in this case. 
but we're going to just see what we can do over time. But we will make clear to them the likeliest path to a negotiated release is going to be through the private payment of a ransom. So we move along with them. Again, we're not negotiating with terrorists. We think of it as negotiating against terrorists. We're having a dialogue with them because you need to talk to them to figure out what it's going to take to get out of this situation and resolve it. I think where there is common ground in Washington is everyone's in agreement. Nobody wants money to go to a terrorist group. But you have to go the extra mile and ask, what's the alternative? Because doing nothing is a choice, but doing nothing also has consequences. So of all the bad choices we have to choose from, the private payment of ransom is probably the least bad option we have that we can go with. People in D.C. tend to look at these kidnappings as abstract ideas where the embassy people are in the real world because they're living this every day. They're more supportive. It's an easier sell to them and what we're working to do. And we're trying to use them to influence the people in Washington to get this moving forward. And again, it goes back to who has the political will to make this happen. So all of that is moving along. Now we have some things that work in our favor during this. It's taking a long time. We happen to have a group established by our former unit chief, Gary Nesner, and some other international counterparts. It's called the International Negotiation Working Group. And it's a group of international negotiators who meet once a year, who share information, who share ideas, who share experiences, essentially. So we each get an idea of what works and what doesn't in our respective cases. Through that group, we learned that there was a Spaniard and a Norwegian who were also held around the same time as Mr. Padron. Our Spanish and Norwegian colleagues filled us in on what to expect because they were ahead of us in their own negotiations, how long this was going to take, how much they were likely to pay, any other detail that could help us because we had lots of experience with the FARC, not so much experience with this particular front of the FARC. So they were very helpful. The U.S. and Colombia have a great working relationship. That works in our favor as well. The ambassador at that time, Ambassador Tom Brownfield, incredibly forward-leaning. He's a guy who's a career-long foreign service officer, served in places like the Philippines where U.S. hostage cases have taken place. So he's very familiar with the problem set. He's very willing to assume calculated risk and be creative in the problem solving. He is an incredible advocate on our behalf. He's super helpful in all of this as well. He deserves a mention. There's pressure by the Colombian government, kind of external pressures where commanders are being picked off by the Colombian and U.S. military. Some of their members are demobilizing. They're leaving the group just because of a variety of issues. All of these things will play a role in, I think, the decision making of the FARC and how willing they are to accept an offer and resolve the situation. Where we run into a little bit of resistance is our ambassador in Panama. She has some concerns with how she believes the FBI initially didn't adequately share information. I think there's some trust issues within the embassy. She's likely got issues going on with the Panamanian government that we aren't aware of. Whatever is happening, it results in resistance. She doesn't really want anything happening in Panama. She's reluctant to allow us to have some flexibility in our work. It gets to the point where we had a trip planned to Panama, and she pulled our country clearances at the last moment. We were at the airport making our connection in Miami, and our country clearances were pulled, which is unheard of. She had some real concerns about what we were doing and how we were going about it. I think we need to explain to listeners about the State Department and host country clearances so they have an understanding of how she could do that to the FBI. Sure. So the ambassador in a country really controls everything in the country. And understandably, most ambassadors, I don't think, welcome help from Washington, D.C. They know their country best. They have their relationships in country. And I think they have a healthy skepticism about how helpful anyone from Washington is going to be. When we travel to these countries, especially on these cases, it's pretty common. We have to request clearance from the embassy to be allowed to travel there on business, essentially. It's pretty standard, just so they're aware of who's in country, what we're doing, what we're working on. We initially got an approval to travel down there. We wanted to have meetings in person. We wanted to talk to her in person, better explain more fully, not leaving it up to necessarily just our legat personnel, but to help in the explanation in hopes of getting her on board to our plan. 
when we we're traveling and she at the last minute pulled our country clearances. It's a pretty dramatic move. I don't know that any of us have ever experienced that before, but I imagine she felt like it was necessary, like she needed to put a hold on everything that was happening. Things were happening too quickly. By holding us out of country, she got an opportunity to regroup. But it sends kind of shockwaves back to Washington. And of course, we're moving along. The family's moving along. The hostage takers are moving along. And they're moving towards at least agreeing on an amount. And we're kind of lagging behind in getting ourselves together in what we're willing to do and support. That's the unfortunate dynamic that is happening. What we do have is over at the State Department, we have colleagues in the counterterrorism office who know what's going on more intimately with the ambassadors. They explain to us what they understand to be the problems so that we're able to better address it. And in fairness to our legat in that embassy, it's not that he didn't have the right message, he wasn't the right messenger. We ended up going to the ambassador of Colombia, Ambassador Brownfield, and asking him to have a conversation with the ambassador of Panama. He, having deep experience, having had worked these cases for years, he had the same message, but he was a different messenger. He was at her level, a commensurate level of ambassador. He understood uniquely her concerns and the potential issues that could evolve with the host country. I don't know what happened in their conversation, but he brought her on board. That was a huge win thanks to Ambassador Brownfield, because again, there were lots of things that were fracturing at that time, unfortunately. We get to a point where the hostage takers, out of nowhere to some degree, decide that they're going to lessen the ransom demand, which is a good indicator for us. I think they're getting restless. I think there are things going on where they want to make this deal and be done with it already. We're not quite ready. The family's ready. They have a generous amount that they're willing to pay and move along with this. What do you mean that the FBI is not ready? What's missing from what you believe needs to be accomplished before the exchange is made? So I would say the FBI and the USG as a whole. We have some very supportive people in our national security law branch, lawyers. And the concern is always, does this ransom payment, would it qualify as material support to terrorists? And our national security law branch attorney would tell you no, because the family is paying under duress under no circumstances should that be considered material support. But there are any number of legal issues that require attorney general authorities in some instances. It's complicated. And I'm not an attorney, and yet I have to track all of these things. But it's essentially our attorneys who are discussing not only is a ransom going to be allowed to be paid, how much of a ransom kind of freaks people out, how we're going to get this money into Panama is another potential issue. This is a part of every kidnapping. We do this all the time. It's because people who don't do this all the time, they're new to it. If they're new to it and enthusiastic about learning, that's fine. That can work. If they're new to it, but entrenched with opinions that are not conducive to a resolution and are kind of wrong-headed, false, fixed beliefs, then that becomes a problem. That's what we have a mix of in Washington. We have some really good people and we have some people who are just creating disruption and dragging this out. We have to get over those hurdles one by one by one and work through it. Are you aware of kidnappings and negotiations with terrorist groups that have been accomplished without government intervention? Somehow, some way, you didn't know about it until after it all worked out. I'm not aware of any, only because it'd be really hard, even if the family does not really want to cooperate, They don't really have much discretion in that because the U.S. is going to be involved because it's on behalf of one of their citizens and the embassy is going to be involved if there's an embassy in country. It's unlikely that they would be able to accomplish that without people knowing just because we're going to share information with our host countries and our allies and through other means. So that would be very difficult to accomplish. But it leads to the direction we're going in, which is the family is frustrated, understandably. I would say the case agents and the negotiators in Miami are equally frustrated because they also don't understand why it's taking so long. The family says, we do not want negotiation assistance anymore. We're going to look for a private company to help us. What they imagine is that the issue is about how much money we're going to pay in ransom, when in reality, the issue is how are we going to move any amount of money into country? We have to coordinate with the Panamanians. There are issues with the Panamanians. I mean, these are corrupt police officers who are involved in the kidnapping. 
there are legitimate issues that are taking time to address and resolve. And I don't think anybody completely trusts anybody else, whether it's within the U.S. government or our counterparts or anywhere else. If you've worked together before, that's great because you probably have relationships. But if you're new to this, then yeah, you don't have a relationship built with people and that trust just isn't there, which leads people to make some bad decisions. But at that point, the family needs a break and they figure we're going to go another route. We prefer that they don't, but we were respectful and figure they're going to have to circle back because, Jerry, they're not going to be able to accomplish this with a private company. Most people don't have kidnap and ransom insurance. It's hard to get insurance once your house burns down. And what they can do is limited. So they have to work within policies of various countries too, like we do. What ends up happening is the family needs to convince himself. The agents in Miami also need to be convinced that some of these delays are legitimate. Some of them are created, yeah, we're not making decisions quickly, but some of these are just inherent to the case and the complexities of the case. Eric gets around to making an offer that they accept it's $3 million that he's willing to pay that he's assembled from the family. Now it's the matter of how do we move this money? People, again, ask, well, is this going to be a wire transfer? Is this actually hard money that you put in a bag? And thankfully, these are things that the FBI and the negotiation unit have worked before. So it's going to be essentially a bag of money that we have to move, but it's going to be moved to Panama, then taken out of a bank. There's all these details and facets of the negotiation that have to be worked out. And it doesn't happen quickly because there are laws in every country that we have to adhere to and coordinate. And none of it is designed to happen quickly. If we could take a moment to talk about Mr. Patron, you talked about them having the infrastructure to kidnap hundreds of people. And I think you mentioned also that they were two or three other Americans who were being held by the FARC at the same time. What is this infrastructure? What is he going through? What is he enduring during this time of negotiation? This is a great segue, Jerry. You are perfectly timed on that question. So this is essentially triple canopy jungle. You're not getting a whole lot of food. You may or may not be chained to a tree at night. You might be with other hostages. What we learn later, and I'll say as hostage survival, Mr. Padron helped himself in a lot of ways. I think because he's a successful businessman, he's a personable guy is what he sounds like. It ends up where one of the people who was responsible for his captivity, they would get to talking about family, about other things, to the point like they built such a nice relationship. I don't know how else to describe it, that that FARC member actually asked to be reassigned because he was worried because he liked Mr. Padron. And he realized that that was potentially a problem. When you have kidnappers who hood themselves to disguise their appearance, it's to create distance. Because when you like someone, it's harder to harm or kill them if you come to that point. My understanding of it, and it's probably better thoroughly explained by the case agents, but in reading some of the material after the prosecutions, this was one of the people who was prosecuted. Some of them, I think, left the group and demobilized, were looking for amnesty. Others certainly are going to be prosecuted. But in their interviews, talking to them about these things, that this came up and it caught my attention because it's about hostage survival and the relationships that you build in that day to day. And even though this person was lower level in the organization, they're not decision maker, they're generally sitting there and being a jailer of sorts. The fact that Mr. Padron had somebody to talk to and that they built some rapport to the point where this guy talked about having a different assignment, I think is significant because you don't see that all the time. And it certainly helped in helping him stay alive and just keep his own head straight in order to endure 10 months in captivity. I learned that after the case concluded, that was a tremendous lesson in how much the hostage themselves influences their immediate captivity experience. They may not influence how quickly they get out or how it all resolves, but their day-to-day -day situation is influenced by their own behavior in captivity, whether that's with the other hostages or their literal captors in that particular camp. And in a lot of ways, Mr. Padron helped himself by being kind of street smart, savvy. He had left Cuba, understood politics, talked to people, very basic things. And that worked in his favor. Where we're going when we're talking about these other hostages, we start in April, now we're in July, July 2nd of 2008. I'm flying to Miami on this case. I land, my phone's blowing up. 
there's been a rescue of the high value hostages. Spectacular rescue by the Colombian military that will go down in history as one of the more spectacular, fascinating rescues, truly, in what it accomplished. They rescued 15 high value hostages. They took them in a helicopter. They had taken over the radio transmissions of the FARC as a ruse, posing as the FARC. They told them we're going to move these hostages. They got everyone on a helicopter. And when they were in the air, they announced that they were actually the Colombian military that the hostages were rescued and that the couple of the FARC commanders were under arrest. Yeah, that sounds like a movie. Yes. I can't even express the relief I felt in that moment for them after years in captivity with no clear path in sight for how they were going to come out. After feeling that relief, my first thought was, how is this going to affect Padron? And I'm fortunate because I had worked the other case as well, had spent a great deal of time in Colombia. That's where I got to know the people in the embassy, the people in the military, the different groups, which was a huge benefit to me so that when Padron came up, those relationships were already established. Devastating blow to the FARC, an embarrassment that they lost essentially all of their high value hostages. Our next thought is how does this impact Padron? We plan for it and we wait and see. And remarkably, there's no mention of it. It's as though the high value hostage group is completely separate from this 57th front of the FARC. They are continuing with their fundraising, essentially, in securing ransoms for the kidnappings, and they proceed with their efforts. And that's a huge relief because any number of things could have gone wrong and didn't. Kind of a funny aside, there was a point during his captivity where some reliable source came forward and claimed that Mr. Padron had tried to take his own life. Based on what was going on through the negotiations, and we got to talk to him periodically, and Eric had the sense he was doing well. He knew the progress reports, essentially. This was completely out of character. This is not somebody who was suicidal. It just didn't make sense. But when we got this news, we figured we have to tell Eric because we want to give it context. And in case he hears from someone else, we want him to know our assessment of it. And just coincidentally, the director had been in Miami that day. So the agents who would normally be in pretty casual clothes because it's Miami and it's hot, showed up to Eric's house in suits. Eric says to them, oh, you guys look like you're going to a funeral. (laughs) And kind of the funny thing is, is they're going to have a conversation with him about this source information that claims his father killed himself, Mm. which again, we don't buy. But thankfully, they have a really good relationship with Eric. He is understanding of what we're saying that we assess it to not be accurate. Maybe it's about somebody else, or maybe it's just confused. We're not concerned about his mental health. We're able to talk to him on a regular basis. We can ask him about it next time we're on the phone with him, but we need to understand this is kind of, people refer to it as stray voltage that comes in. And sometimes it just comes out of nowhere and we have to address it because it can certainly worry legitimately the family and others on if there's some truth to it. He was good about accepting and moving on. All of that's good. We're moving along. He left to go see if he can get a private insurance company. He comes back because he realizes that's not going to work and things kind of pick up. Coincidentally, in September of 08, there's a lien on one of the properties in Panama that's also in the news that we can point to with the FARC to demonstrate, hey, you see these money problems we're having? This is what's going on. It comes out of nowhere, but we're going to use it to our advantage. Their impatience, certainly continued impatience with the progress, but we're going to do what we can. We make the deal on the $3 million. There's an agreement on $3 million, but the issue becomes, again, how are we going to move this? He encourages them to take the money now because things could change and the situation on the ground continues to change. So essentially coordinate whatever it is you need to do. By October, the FARC suggests a delivery plan. We take it to the embassies in Panama and Colombia. What is super helpful in Colombia, again, they do this all the time. They meet their country team, the ambassador, their law enforcement group. They discuss it with the regional security officer, who's the diplomatic security agent from the Department of State in the embassy, who is responsible for security. And one of our ALATs gives us a two-page rundown of their assessment of what the FARC has suggested. Super helpful because it essentially says there's no way that you should do this drop as it's explained, but here's some alternatives that will be less risky. Here's what we suggest. Incredibly useful information. They play a big role. Everybody in the embassy in Colombia is helping us a lot in moving this along. We continue to move it. The ambassador in Panama does not want the drop. The ambassador in Colombia is willing, but recognizes it's not as safe in Colombia 
and encourages that conversation with the ambassador in Panama, we need to do it there. It all is starting to come together slowly. We learned that the Spaniard that was held ended up being held three months after the ransom was paid, which is of concern to us because we'd like it to be soon after. But again, something we've got to negotiate and discuss and figure out with the hostage takers themselves. We're moving along and it's November and December and we're still working through these issues. And then to some degree, we get to a point where we're bumping up against elections in Panama and other external things that all of a sudden people are a little more forward leaning in getting this thing resolved. We're at the point where we're planning a drop of money in Panama and we need to figure out how we do this with the family. And what we have done in the past is using a helicopter to literally push a bag of money out into the jungle with coordinates. And it looked like we were going to do it here. We had suggested someone in particular to Eric to talk to. The kinds of questions he should ask them, we're not endorsing them, we're not recommending them so much as we're saying this is somebody who works in this area. We trust him, we know him, he's a former U.S. military. We think it's worth having a conversation with him because this is likely the way you're going to need to go in this. Again, Eric's a smart guy and he does what he needs to. Beck has a lot of heartburn in Washington over how involved the FBI is in facilitating the payment. My feeling is that if we're sitting on information that could be helpful to the family, why would we not share that with them so that they can make informed decisions, essentially eliminate as much risk as we can in this whole situation? And I guess the risks are twofold. The actual kidnapping or injury of a family member who may want to make that payment directly are just them being duped and defrauded. They're paying the wrong person and the kidnappers say, okay, where's my three million that you were supposed to drop off? And they, we already did. So you're preventing additional crimes from happening. Exactly, Jerry. We want to protect the family member. We want to protect the person who's physically delivering the money. We want to protect the money. We don't want to get ripped off. We want to protect the hostage. This is a time to slow things down, essentially, to make sure we have thought through and addressed everything we can very deliberately. Understandably, this is where other people want to pick up the pace and just get it done. But we want to be deliberate. We want to be thoughtful about it and think it through because we know there's a lot of potential for things to go wrong and go sideways. And we've invested so much time and energy in this that we want it to be successful. We moved the money on February 20th of 09. So this is 10 months later. The private payment of ransom is paid. Mr. Padron is released about three days later dropped off along a highway near the Colombian border. His first wife talked a little bit in the press about the fact that he lost approximately 50 pounds in captivity. Mr. Padron did not have 50 pounds to lose, but you're eating what the captors are eating. It's not like a lot of food or anything. His hair is long and white, as is his beard. Certainly, I'm sure it's shocking for the family to see him in this condition. And at the same time, they're relieved and happy that he's out and liberated. They have truly themselves to thank for that because it's really the family cooperating and collaborating throughout that makes this work. A portion of the ransom was later recovered for evidence, thankfully, because they were given coordinates on where the drop zone was. Essentially, that gives us a lot of information about where the group is and how it works and so on and so forth. Investigatively, all of that is important. What I will say is that hostage takers are confused about hostage policy. They tend to assume everyone has insurance when most people don't. They tend to assume governments pay, but publicly they say that they don't, which is not true. So we're really working against perceptions and misperceptions all the time. The FARC members have a genuine concern about being extradited to the United States. Some of their comrades are already serving time in the United States, so they're worried about being caught as they should be because this goes on where the case agents, again, and we're talking about DEA and FBI and a whole host of investigative agencies working together to build cases against these guys. The kidnapping of Mr. Padron and specifically the payment of that ransom makes for key evidence in breaking this case wide open. I think that becomes the important aspect of why we do negotiate against terrorists why paying the private ransom is the best route amongst the options we have available to us in order to secure the safe release of a U.S. hostage. So this case went on to receive an attorney general award for the identification, apprehension, and prosecution 
of approximately 60 individuals. They had two jury trials, 11 convictions, and sentences ranging from 10 to 29 years. Quite a success for everyone involved, and especially for the people who ended up putting the case together for prosecution. The greatest value in my mind, Jerry, and why I want to talk about this case today is because it's specific to hostage policy. It's specific to a foreign terrorist organization and the private payment of ransom. In this case, we see what is doable, what the U.S. government can live with and agree upon. We've litigated a number of issues and essentially settled them so that in the future, as additional cases come up, which they will, these issues are already settled and we can be more efficient with our time, which makes sense. I think in fairness, the family focused on the things that only they can do within their control. They didn't come to Washington. They didn't reach out to congressional representatives. They really used their energy towards those things that were going to make a difference. I think they got good support overall, although there's certainly plenty of room for improvement. We did leave, I would say, Mr. Bedrone in captivity longer than he needed to be because the family was ready, the hostage takers were ready, Padron was ready, the U.S. government was a little bit slow in making decisions. But in fairness, it's still success. It should serve the cases in the future after this. That's all important. I also want to mention that this was resolved at the beginning of the Obama administration. I would say that in my experience, it makes less difference who is in the White House as opposed to who the career government officials are working the cases. I think it matters most when we have someone like Brian Losey, who's leading the hostage working group and making people accountable. That makes a difference. When we have an ambassador like Ambassador Brownfield in Colombia, that makes a difference because without them, none of these things would have happened. So we've created this framework to streamline efforts for the future, but the framework is incredibly fragile. Did you ever get a chance to meet Mr. Patron after he came back or follow up with the family? I know the case agents also have those opportunities, but I was just wondering if you had that chance. The case agents did, the local negotiators certainly did. Honestly, I don't remember, but I don't believe I did. What I do remember, the ambassador of Panama invited us to Panama later that year after the release to work on some of the demobilization efforts with the Panamanian government. So that was a nice little win, an acknowledgement from her that she really was, I think, in a tough bind. Everybody, again, has different motivations and different stressors weighing on them throughout these incidents. She made it right by inviting us in country later that year. That must have been very validating to know not only that she understood the FBI's purpose, but also to get an opportunity to work so that those misunderstandings don't happen again. Absolutely. I think that's really the crux of it, Jerry, is for those of us who work together over and over and over on cases, you get a certain rhythm and you get to know each other. You know who you can trust. You know who's reliable. And sometimes you're just new to a situation. And understandably, you are reluctant, especially at an ambassador level where you have so much to potentially lose. These are high-risk decisions. There are implications that impact relations. That's not lost on me. I have an understanding and appreciation for it. Sometimes I don't think everybody does just because they don't see it and they're not working at that level of it every day. That's an investment in the future so that if she's someplace where there's another kidnapping of a U.S. citizen, she has that experience and hopefully we leave her with a good experience that anyone who follows us will benefit from. In this particular case, the ransom demand is to a family. He's wealthy. But I would assume that there are just as many times, if not more, where that ransom demand is to a corporation and the person that's being held is an employee. Yes, that is a dynamic, although not as common. Most of the people who get kidnapped are journalists who are freelancers, aid workers, so humanitarian aid workers, and dual citizens, Haiti, Mexico, who maybe are running back and forth. And if they drive a decent car, they may give the appearance of wealth or means to the kidnappers. Not as often are there U.S. citizens who are kidnapped who are either have insurance or have an employer, but that does happen as well. 
That's interesting because for me, I'm learning something. I'm thinking like an executive that works for a major soft drink company might be kidnapped or a person there that represents a studio. Something like that would be kidnapped because they know that the corporation has deep pockets, but those are not as prevalent as I'm thinking. Not as prevalent. And Jerry, I think there's a reason behind it. I think a lot of these places, if they're sending people to dangerous places or really sending them anywhere overseas, they're giving them some training. They're mitigating that risk and they're providing some security. There's less likelihood of them being grabbed simply because a little bit of training goes a long way. I think when you look at large aid organizations like International Red Cross, United Nations, they're in the riskiest parts of the globe. They still have people kidnapped, but not as many as could be because they're very forward leaning in the training aspect and assuming that people adhere to the training, the likelihood of them getting kidnapped or killed lessens. It doesn't completely eradicate that risk, but it mitigates some of it, which is important. This is the time for me to use my catchphrase. This is so fascinating to me. I really am fascinated by the fact that the people responsible for the kidnappings were actually identified, charged, and extradited back to the U.S. I know that was a whole different team, but after we finished with this case review, when we're talking offline, I'd love to learn more about who might have been involved with that because I'd love to do a follow-up on that particular investigation. You provided a newspaper article about the final resolution and the extradition of the guerrilla group, the terrorists that were involved in the kidnapping. I'm going to include that newspaper article in the show notes for this episode. But boy, I'd love to, again, do a follow-up case review on how they were able to get to those terrorists and bring them back and the trial that sent them to prison. Jerry, you bring up, again, another outstanding point, because what I would like to say is that this is my vantage point, but every single person involved in this case is looking at it from a slightly different vantage point. And although we're going to have shared recollections of the facts, we each are going to have different contributions that we made, different understanding of what was going on at the time. So it's important, really, if you were to do like more of a 360, a lot of times the government does not take the time after a case to really do a thorough after action to memorialize what was good, what could we change up, what would we do better in the future. What we rely on is maybe journalists or academics who do research and then fill in the blanks on some of the things that we do and how it shapes hostage policy. I think you make an important point that the investigative vantage point was likely going to be slightly different in many ways. What they end up doing with this after securing the safe release of Mr. Padron is admirable and super deserving of the Attorney General Award. And probably most importantly, that award gives recognition to what we did in this case and what everybody in the U.S. government could live with on this case. So that cases in the future, and we've got lots of them on the horizon after this resolves, can go from that point and build on that. Again, fascinating. You spent many years of your career working hostage negotiations. I think I was saying in your bio that you were in the crisis negotiation unit for at least 13 years, but you did this before you went to headquarters in the field, and then you continued to do it after you left the unit at Quantico? Yes. I was a field negotiator in Milwaukee. I was on the critical incident negotiation team, and then I came to work at the crisis negotiation unit at Quantico. So I spent over 20 years of my career as a negotiator, and a real privilege in the last 13 doing that full-time. I have, I think, a special appreciation for the value of the field negotiators, having been one and knowing when they're the face of the government to a family and the family's under a lot of stress. That stress can be contagious. They're making very hard decisions and we put them in an impossible position. I work to try and relieve as much of that as I can to adequately prepare them, to collaborate with them, to support them in any way that I can, because I know it's an important job. And I know that is going to literally make or break a case. Hats off to our field negotiation program in all the support that they provide on these cases. 
Well, we're going to talk in just a bit about what you're doing now because you're still working in the field. But I want to go right now to my standard question of when and why you joined the FBI. And did you have any idea that this is what you would end up doing in the Bureau as an agent? No, I was working for the U.S. Department of Labor in Chicago. My lifelong aspiration was public service. And I happened to be working on an intergovernmental working group where a recruiter from the FBI was also on that same team. And it was during a hiring surge with the Bureau in the mid-90s that he approached me and they were looking for people with language skills and any variety of things. And I just thought, I'll put my application in and see where it goes. It sounds curious. I didn't know about their negotiation program, but having worked as a labor negotiator, it seemed like a natural fit in many ways. And I think just the way my career ended up going, I was given a lot of opportunities and it was something I thought I could dedicate myself to. And it it ended up working out in the long run for me. When did you retire? I retired in 2018. All right. So it's been a number of years Mm -hmm. since you left the Bureau, but you've continued to utilize those skills that you gained in the FBI in this field. What are you doing now? Now I dedicate to prevention, hostage prevention and security awareness, hostage survival. So I'll oftentimes speak at conferences, speak to groups about specifically risk to themselves personally. The State Department has done a good job in some of the changes with the hostage policy changes in saying like, do not travel list. But I think there's a whole lot more to the prevention side. And there seems to be a gap in the training of that. It was a small window where I think I could dedicate and mitigate some of the risk and hopefully eliminate some of these cases that happen that maybe if they did things a little bit differently, that somebody else would be the victim and not them. It sounds like there will always be victims because there will always be terrorists. So I understand what you're saying about who will be the victim. For me personally, I prefer to support and target the people who are less likely to have the means to get outside training. So when you're working with smaller groups or organizations that wouldn't have this otherwise, large corporations can afford this. There's a lot of people working in it. There's a lot of money to be made in it. That's not my personal focus, although I know it does serve a purpose. I'm more interested in reaching the people who wouldn't have the availability of the training otherwise, because it's cost prohibitive to remove that barrier and get to the people who are most likely to be victims. Someone that's interested in learning from you, how do they reach you? How do people get in touch with you? I'm not on LinkedIn. I would say the easiest way to get in touch with me, if you were to Google me, you can find my contact information pretty easily. I also work with a network of friends and former colleagues. Usually most people contact me through other people I'm working with through word of mouth just to narrow down potential opportunities. But I welcome the outreach and don't let me not being on LinkedIn be a hurdle to tracking me down. Very good. You're going to make them work for it. (laughs) (laughs) How motivated are they? They could just easily find somebody else too. Very good. Again, this has been fascinating. At the end of every episode, I like to give my guest the last word. What would you like to say? My last word would be to families, to encourage them to cooperate and collaborate with the U.S. government, but to let the government earn their trust and to not hesitate in asking questions and probing credentials because it's important. This is their loved one. They want to make sure they leave the situation feeling as though they did everything within their power to secure the safe release of their loved one. And if they can't say that at the end of the day, then that is not success. I hope that my colleagues today who are working this are the right people working in this type of tense crisis environment. And that's the end of the interview. I would love to review this case again from the field office investigative side. The case agents in Miami went on to investigate, extradite, and convict members of the FARC for this kidnapping. I've reached out and hope to hear back from them soon. 
In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com where you'll find a photo of Zorka Martinovich, links to articles about this kidnapping and about how we negotiate with terrorists, as well as links to more FBI retired case file review episodes featuring hostage negotiation cases, including that kidnapped granny snatcher case that Zorka worked on. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.